Okay, good evening. Thank you for joining the Southern Illinois University Edwardsville Alumni Association and Lynch Library for an event I'm confident will inspire you. My name is Dr. Liz Pankel and I serve as the Dean of Lovejoy Library. <laughs> Those of you that were able to attend in person, I hope you enjoyed the reception and had a chance to meet some of our brilliant students and see such presentations of their political and historical research. Tonight, I have the privilege of welcoming both our in-person and virtual guests to the celebration of a unique collection of political and historical papers, photos, and materials that honor Congressman John Chimpas's decades of civic duty <clears throat> and service to our country. So welcome. We are glad you chose to be our guest. SIUE and the Lovejoy Library are honored <coughs> to preserve the John Chimpas Co Congressional Collection and make this historic material available to students, the region, and the world. And I'd like to give a spe special shout out to our online learning librarian, Mitchell Haas, who has been single-handedly um, processing the collection. And also helping courses um, in terms of integrating it into his pedagogy. I would like to introduce two leaders and distinguished alumni of our university. The facilitator of this evening's interview was Dr. Randy Pembroke, the ninth chancellor of SIUE. Before I introduce our guest of honor, on a, and on behalf of the SIUE and Lovejoy Library, I would like to express our gratitude to Congressman Shinkas and his wife, Karen, also an SIUE alumnus for entrusting us with your congressional papers. Because of your gift, our university has the opportunity to preserve, explore, and make available this amazing collection to students, scholars, and the general public. And now the person we all came here to celebrate, please help me welcome Congressman John Shimkus. Well, thank you, Dean Pankel, for that introduction. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here tonight, and I want to say thank you to you and to your staff for arranging this wonderful event. Congressman Shimkus, this is an incredible honor. Today, we sit in the same library that you and I visited many times as students. Well, at least I hope you visited many times. <laughs> Before we jump into some interview questions, I'd like to share a brief biography of your story and history-shaping accomplishments Congressman Shimkus is the son of Gene and Kathleen Shimkus. He grew up 10 miles from SIUE in Collinsville, Illinois. Your story is the kind of story we all love to hear. You were the small town kid that worked hard and had a big dream of serving your country. Your diligence took you to places most of us only read about. Congressman Shimkus attended Collinsville High School and upon graduation, he entered the United States Military Academy in West Point, New York, and graduated in 1980. Then he served as an active duty Army officer for more than five years. He married Karen Booth in 1987, and they have three children, David, Joshua, and Daniel. The congressman also earned a teaching certificate from California's Christ College Urban, now known as Concordia University Urban. After serving in the Army, he returned to Southwestern Illinois to teach high school at Metro East Lutheran High School in, uh, in excuse me, Metro East Lutheran High School in Edwardsville. In 1997, he completed his MBA at SIUE while simultaneously beginning a political career. For 24 consecutive years, Congressman Shimka served in the U.S. House of Representatives. He was elected to the 20th Congressional District of Illinois the 19th Congressional District, and from 2013 to 2021, he represented the 15th Congressional District of Illinois. At the heart of Congressman Shimkus, you will find a public servant that never forgot his small town roots and still possesses a positive view of our country. He has experienced a front row seat to American history. He represented our region during 9-11, impeachments, wars, and economic ups and downs. Now, Congressman, that list seemed kind of depressing to me. So I uh, went on Google and I looked up world's most important events during your period of time in office. It included things such as the International Space Station in 2000, the iPhone in 2007, the NASA flight by Pluto in 2015, and then there was Facebook, which debuted in 2004. I don't know which list to put that one on. <laughs> 
Congressman Shimkus is most proud of include passing bills that ensured every cell phone could dial 911 in an emergency, placing heart defibrillators in schools, and updating regulations regarding toxic substances. Thank you for being a great, great leader in our country, and thank you for representing SIUE well and being a shining example of fulfilling our mission to develop professionals, scholars, and leaders to shape a changing world. <laughs> Are you ready for some questions? I am ready, Chancellor. Good, because we want to hear some details from behind the scenes. Let's start, kind of go back to the early days. Congressman Shimkus, what inspired you to choose politics as a career? Can you tell us a little bit about the early years? I was always involved in student government. Back at Holy Cross Lutheran Church, I was, uh, I think, the president of the eighth grade class. I was involved in high school, eighth grade uh, uh, class, you know, rep uh, program along with student council there. Also involved with fellow Christian athletes. So working with people, getting along with people has always been part of the, you know, the deal. When I we go to the academies, and I got a couple of academy grads out here. One's a classmate, one's I nominated to the Naval Academy. I don't know why you would want to go there. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, the Mel Price was the, the person who nominated me. So some of the old folks here would know Mel Price, chairman of the Armed Services Committee, served over 40 years. And I got a chance to visit him a couple times in DC and walking around DC, it's a very uh, kind of exciting place. I mean, that's kind of the hub of democracy in the world. Um, the world kind of goes to DC. And I think I got uh, intrigued by that, really not thinking I'd ever serve. I just thought I'd want to try. And again, I'm a Christian by faith. I believe God's in control. And both the doors opened up and we worked hard. And, there I was. <laughs> you know, so. Very good, very good. Let, let me give you a chance. Uh, you're not the kind of person to brag, but let me give you a chance to talk about some of the things that occurred, uh, some of the accomplishments that occurred while you were in Washington, and maybe in particular things that uh, you were very passionate about. Well, as my students know, and they're all over there, and I'm hoping they'll stay awake. Um, so they heard me say that when you're a member of Congress, you get assigned really to a committee, and that's kind of where you become a subject matter expert. Uh, there's a lot of things you want to do, and there are some offsets of things that you can do, but I was was able to go on the Energy and Commerce Committee. So that kind of, you know, kind of directs the work you can do in energy, healthcare, telecommunications, environment issues, uh, oversight of the agencies of the Committee of Jurisdiction. Again, my students and we preach this all the time. So some of the stuff that you look at out of those committees, what is it important in those committees that help your citizens of Southern Illinois? So for me, uh, whether it was biodiesel to get more markets for soybeans or a beef towel, or it was ethanol, and we all know ethanol, so I was very involved with that from the beginning of my career. And that's not even a partisan issue. I, I, I replaced now Senator Durbin, and he was a big ethanol supporter, and I took his old congressional seat. So if you want to represent Southern Illinois, you better be supportive of our agricultural products. So uh, in fact, the National Corn and Ethanol Research Center here on campus was uh, delivered by us, uh, Senator Durbin, Hastert, myself, uh, and we fought to get it here versus someplace in Iowa. And uh, we won that fight. We don't win them all, but we did win that fight. Uh, the, uh, so that's, we, you mentioned 911, because I was on the telecommunications committee. You mentioned uh, the emergency, auxiliary emergency defibrillators, AEDs, because I'm on the health subcommittee. Uh, and then the one that, again, my students hear me talk about all the time is the Toxic Substances Control Act. Now, how many people run on, they're very proud, excited about reforming, Toxic chemicals, right? But uh, that was a bill that took five and a half years. Uh, President Obama signed it. It's uh, it's not a small bill. It was a really a rewrite of a, the original law that was passed in 1976 and hadn't been touched. So we know 
science, technology, research all improves, but we should be able to do a better job in expediting chemicals that are safe and ident identifying chemicals that aren't safe and get them off the market. So that, it's not one you campaign on. You don't go around the district and say, yeah, hey, I have Tosca, you know, and everybody's going, what? Um, but uh, that's the one I'm probably most proud of. So we are really proud of Congressman Shimkus. Uh, he is teaching here now, and he referenced his students. And we had a chance to talk earlier in the day, and I could tell in the phone conversation how proud he was of the students and, and the process of teaching. And one of the things that, that I want to ask him about has to do with the collection. Uh, when he collected his papers and, and items that he had, part of what he's doing within the class is using that class as structure for students to do research. So uh, there are projects that the students have done about voting and, and, and what that's like. They're about the election certification, how to pass laws. And then there are artifacts that the students got excited about in terms of looking at the Coca-Cola bottle from the uh, Obama campaign. And I think your baseball hat from the uh, congressional uh, baseball games. So it must give you a, a sense of satisfaction. And I'm just curious as you think about what you've seen so far in the future, uh, the kinds of things that you imagine that the students, the, the research areas, the, the things within the collection that you think will be of interest to students now and in the future. Yeah, I'm not sure my students were very excited that first day, Mitchell, when we went down there and I said, you get to look at all this stuff and find something to report on. But uh, I found it, it's, it's been very exciting to see the, the 100 level class, they go down, to where the archives are and they can just grab something that's interests them and then they report on it some of the stuff they find i know oh i remember what that is some of the stuff i have no idea <laughs> what it is um and so then we do our own research together to figure it out so it's i think that's been uh, a good operation and i know who to send them to i said well i don't know what it is but uh, in fact in one case Kate was here i said Let's call the public affairs officer at Scott Air Force Base. We'll figure, we'll figure this out. And uh, in the upper level class, what we did was they got to they got to have more than one. They got to have two. Uh, we call them artifacts, and it's got to be related to this chapter that we're covering. So it, it it really helps make the book real. I mean, it's 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 real data. It may be campaign finance information. It could be an invitation to a political event that we, we've had. And so it weaves into the chapter they, they read, because I, mean, I quiz them every week. So they, I force them to make sure they read. And so it, it reinforces that, but then it reinforces with real, real world data that I, I think is helpful. Um, I think I'm going to point out to the, the, the library staff and, and, and Mitchell have done a great work. I think they're starting to get an appreciation of um, uh, the students that not a lot of people handle primary documents and they get to do it the first year here. And uh, I think that's pretty cool. So I, I can say at least one student is excited. I, I had the chance to read the papers and I wrote down a quote. The, the student said, it's amazing a person's whole life in front of you. What an energized life Congressman Shimkus has had. So yeah, I'm not sure, I'm kind of scary too, right? <laughs> uh, I mean, I think uh, Deb Detmer's here has also helped a lot with the uh, getting the material put together. I think they tried to make sure that real super embarrassing stuff behind there. Uh, <laughs> but I don't think we can promise that we've got it all, huh, Deb? I'm not sure. There might be some in there. And of course, when you serve 24 years in Congress, I tell folks that you're going to get scarred. Uh, this is an even more so now in the environment we're in today. And the question is, are the scars visible or are they not visible? So uh, there is stuff in there that was hard periods of our life. Right, Karen? Um, so we did not glean them out. They, they are there. And you can ask me afterwards. I don't want to volunteer it. But, uh, you know, serving in elective office in the public eye is not for the length of heart. So 24 years, that means that you were in Washington 
for many presidents, and specifically Bill Clinton, George W. Bush, Barack Obama, and Donald Trump. So, uh, not to put you on the spot, but do you have any inside stories that you want to share with a few of your closest friends here? Uh, well, I knew you were going to ask that one, so I, it would, they're all obviously very unique and different presidents. Um, you know, my, the first one I served with was Bill Clinton. I ran in 92 and lost when he had his first elect. And as if you remember that cycle, he was rolled in that one. I mean, George uh, HW 41 was at 90% approval rate when I announced. And then he probably only got 35% on election day. It was a, it was a whooping. Um, but then, so, and I didn't win either. So 96, I won, that was Clinton's reelect. And uh, two things, I got to fly Air Force One with President Clinton twice. Uh, one was uh, 747, the big one, to my alma mater, West Point, uh, where he spoke, and it's traditional for the president, the commander in chief, to, to speak at one of the academy graduations every year. And so that was obviously really cool. And I can remember vividly that the first time I flew, ever flew on a helicopter was after a road march. Um, I keep looking at Mike. Um, and then they picked us up in a helicopter and they flew us back on the plane, which is the parade field. The second time I went in a helicopter was on Marine One with the President of the United States. I, I just like, where, where else but in America can, can that happen? Um, the second time with Bill Clinton, he actually, after a State of Union address, he went on his road show. Uh, one of the places he stopped was Peoria, which was in my district. So I flew out with him. I think that's telling uh, in that, you know, it's, 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 those who watch State of the Union, they see how competitive it is now for standing and sitting. But, you know, my point is every time a president asks you to be with them, yeah, you kind of serve all people in your district and you, you should be honored to go. So uh, Senator Fitzgerald, also a Republican, went and we were there for his speech in the, in the square there in Quincy, Illinois, very memorable. Um, George W. Bush, I spent a lot of time with him. Of course, he's a Republican, I'm a Republican, and he was a baseball guy. Um, his first four years, really, though, he really worked and networked with Democrats. He really did believe that he could develop an education program, which we now know didn't work as well as we would have liked. No Child Left Behind, but that was a passage with Democrats, Ted Kennedy. And then when that started going south and some other, uh, the wars and stuff, then he kind of circled the wagons and we spent a little more time with, with George Douglas. One of them, Shimkus is ethnically Lithuanian. Um, and we have a big Lithuanian Catholic community in East St. Louis. The church is still there. There's a very small Lithuanian Lutheran church in Collinsville. Uh, not enough time to talk about why that is, and who they are, but I was part of that group. Uh, four generations back to, to uh, the Protestant part of Lithuania. And I really have spent a lot of time on NATO and NATO enlargement, especially for the Baltics and Eastern European countries. So Karen and I, we were overseas at a NATO meeting, a parliamentary meeting, but the, the other big meeting for the heads of state were, were, were in Prague. And so uh, after that, President Bush was going to Vilnius, Lithuania, to give a speech about the invitation of, of Lithuania to join NATO. And the president of Lithuania allowed me to fly in his plane to get there. And then uh, I was in the city, city square when, the, when George W. Bush gave that speech, which is a pretty historic speech about peace, democracy, freedom, and, and the uh, unity of nations. Uh, democracy and rule of law uh, it's it's, a, it's very memorable for me karen couldn't go but uh i got to go so um then uh then we got president obama back to students we we were talking about my my basketball game with president obama um the democrats really wanted to play basketball with the president and the president wanted to make it bipartisan so there was two republicans he invited me and jeff flake of the jeff flake Fame. And it was on the, President Obama had uh, taken the tennis court, turned it into a basketball court. 
but we were playing basketball and only one or two pictures of that basketball game got released officially to the press. And once you know it, me with my one quarter each believe <laughs> guarding President Obama who's like skying way. In fact, the students I talked about that said, you know, in class today, you can just pull it up. So they did Wikipedia and sure enough, that's one of the dang photos on Wikipedia. So uh, I'm, uh, I'm never going to forgive it. But uh, he did sign the Tosco bill, so that was good. Um, President Trump, uh, I had uh, I don't have a lot of relationships. I was involved with, uh, there is a big picture in the archives for anyone who wants to go down there. Well, see Mitchell first. Um, and it's about, and I'm not going to tell you how I got it, but it's about four, it's about this big, by about this high. And if you've been to the White House before, you know that there are, when you go through security, they have these pictures, candid photos of day-by-day -day activities of the president, the first lady, the cat, the dog, you know, all that stuff with the kids. And it was in the um, treaty room. Um, and President Trump sitting here, I think Orrin Hatch is next to him to his left, and I'm too removed. Uh, I can't remember who's to the right, but my roommate, Kevin Brady, is too removed, but the camera's blocking him, so that was cool. Um, <laughs> and President Trump's doing this President Trump thing. And it was really on that tax, HR1 tax, the tax reform bill, I got put on the I got put on the conference committee. My students know what a conference committee is. It's when the House and the Senate pass different bills and you have to reconcile them and you go to a conference. So I was on the conference committee to reconcile the bill only because energy, energy committee, Lisa Murkowski, who just announced she's running again from Alaska, was able to insert uh, as a funder uh, drill in Alaska. Well, that gave jurisdiction to Energy and Commerce. So we had to have someone from Energy and Commerce on the campus committee. So I was there at the request of the president to do his photo shoot with uh, the leaders of the conference committee uh, on HR1. So uh, I had less interaction with President Trump than the other ones. So in looking back and then thinking about the current state of affairs in Washington, uh, one of the questions that uh, I, I'm just really curious as to how you are going to respond. It, it seems like political views have become, I, I will say, polarized. Uh, there seems to be less cooperation across the aisle. Uh, I, I don't know if you've addressed that in your class, if, if, if students are interested in that, but just um, what, what, what do you think the future of politics is and civil discourse in particular compared to you know, when, when you went to Congress 24 years ago, uh, how, how does that compare to what's going on now? Yeah, I, I think you, you I, a lot of people will tell me all the time, aren't you glad you're not there? Uh, isn't it terrible? And I, it is sad and it is frustrating. Um, I think the important thing is knowing history, the history of our country. Uh, and we just covered this. We were talking about our founders, really. And you could name six of them who said, don't develop political parties. Madison, Hamilton, Jefferson, obviously uh, Washington is for a farewell speech. But you know, we as people can't not, not get to like funny people. So right after that, you had the Federalist and the Anti-Federalist really fighting. I mean, kicking and scratching and gouging each other's eyes out. Shoot, you've had kings, you've had duels. Um, so uh, simple human nature is going to have strife, um, but we have to, we just got to keep preaching. And, and I think it's a challenge of um, our citizens to like people who understand you can disagree without being disagreeable. Uh, and that's what we kind of talk about. The students know my political ideology. I kind of know some of theirs, they've been a little shy. I mean, we haven't had any fights. But I just encourage them to go their way, what they want to do. I said, here's me, and this is you, and that's fine. But eventually, you got to govern. I think what's happened now, and I, I gave a, 
fact, the library allowed me to take a projector to a um, Lutheran older adult retreat uh, in Pierre Marquette. And they asked me to speak on uh, why can't we get along? And so I just put together a little program where I said, we really do like each other. And I showed the clips of the congressional baseball game and how we're back slab and having fun and talking. And, uh, but there are things that drive us apart. So the challenge is not to allow the things that drive us apart from being friends. Uh, things that drive us apart are redistricting, gerrymandering. We're seeing it in Illinois, you see it in Republican states. So when you push more ideologues into the same district, then you have then you have a harder time recovering. So you get far, far, far right Republicans, and you get far, far, far left. My first district was a moderate district. And so I, I had to be more receptive to moderate voices than when I got drawn into a more conservative district. And I think the other thing that is a change is just because of media and uh, what we're doing live streaming now and is uh, the nationalization of politics. I mean, we talk more about, you know, the uh, infrastructure bill than we talk about the city council meeting and garbage pickup, you know, and, and, and water and the things that we really need every day. Uh, and now I, I know people who are in the local, like I was local treasurer. That's getting a pretty tough environment too. Because people aren't, uh, I mean, people are descending and they want to know what's going on, which we should encourage, right? But I, I'm not sure where the, where the, where the hatred and the, and the ability not to listen to folks anymore. That's, that's really the sad aspect of what we're dealing with these days. When you think back about relationships that you had, let's say, across the aisle, as, as they say, who were some of those people? How did those relationships develop? And what people aren't having a beer on Fridays anymore, or, or how does that happen? Well, we don't go out to eat very much together anymore because as soon as the boats are done, we're flying home. Yeah. So you're not you're not in DC together over a weekend uh, just because of the ability to travel. And my family lived here, and I had to be home. I had to be home to help Karen with the kids or at least give her a day break or something. So uh, uh, that's part of that issue. Now we do, when we, when we get to travel together, we do make, that helps because you're, you're with them for four or five days, you're going overseas and you're doing these meetings and, and stuff. So, so that's very helpful. You know, I like to bring in real world examples of things. And so I use current events all the time in my classes. So today, Patrick Leahy announced he's not going to run again. I love Patrick Leahy. Uh, I've known him for my years of service. Uh, he's liberal, but he's just a decent man. And I served on the uh, uh, Smithsonian uh, board with him on my last Congress. Just a decent, decent man. So, uh, but he also mentioned in his speech today a guy named Peter Welch. Um, who's my colleague in the House Servant Energy and Commerce Committee. So I, I can show you, I texted Peter, I said, hey, I love Senator Leahy, but are you gonna run? <laughs> you know? And he goes, today is Senator Leahy's day. And uh, we'll see what Peter does. And I just said, you'd be a great senator. So there's a lot more of that there. I, uh, Rodney Davis's dad is back there. And Rodney is great at making friends across the aisle. Uh, he, uh, he's, he's a gifted politician and a, and a great uh, public servant, but he really does have, I mean, across the aisle. And they, they actually do joint events and he'll bring them to Illinois, he'll go to their district. So we, we need to applaud people like that and not raise up people who just don't want to talk to us. I, like they're, it's, it's, it is tribal. So we got to get out of our tribes a little bit. Get, get to know people, get to know uh, people on a daily basis across the aisle. Um, so I, I'll tell a story in a moment that uh, it, it, I can't think of you without a kindness that uh, you uh, showed to me at, at one point. I'll, I'll tell that story. But, but before we do that, I want to ask you of if this is what people probably think goes on in Congress. And this is what actually goes on in Congress. 
Uh, how, how are those uh, perceptions versus reality? How, how do they differ? Well, the, the thing that I mentioned uh, at, at the retreat was I, I think people think politicians are, we're, we just live a lavish lifestyle. I, you know, they think we've got chauffeurs, they think that we have private planes, and that it is really hard. The thing that unites politicians across the board is everyone has to get elected. I love the House of Representatives. And the student, my students know this, this I could have tested them. What is the only off federal office that you have to be elected? There's only one, and that's the House of Representatives. Right? You could be president without ever having been elected mm -hmm. um, because of president dying, vice president, you know, you can just go through the motion. So in the House, even if it's a really conservative district or a very liberal district, those primaries are tough. So that's something that really unites us. Um, and then again, Karen's here, and I'm glad she is. Um, it's, it is really hard on the family. I mean, I, you know, if I were to do it all over again, uh, you you got to go politically. You got to hit. You got to hit the the tape when it's time to run, right? You can't. You if you wait, um, that window may not be open. So we did it pretty young. So I got elected. My my kids were three and one. Uh, when I left, they were. 26, 24, and 20, or 20. Um, did I miss a few things? Yeah. I mean, a lot of people, I'm not going to cry. I mean, everybody, everybody who has professions, you know, they go, man, I had to be away at this conference, or I had to do this. But one that really, I'll never forget myself is, uh, I missed, I didn't make a single day for one of my sons one year. And I, and I tried to get home. I. And so for some, someone died or something. And so we had Wednesday off. So I got, a, this is when there was a bazillion flight. So I got a flight, uh, I was gonna fly home to make the Tuesday night game. And we're landing at Lambert. And I look up and it's raining. <laughs> so I go home, we have dinner. And I go back to the airport and I catch the red eye and I fly back to DC. I, people just don't know how difficult wanting to serve and the challenges are out there and that's what i wish people would appreciate more. they may not hate us so much if they know that we actually work right? yeah. on our behalf that's what we, that what we profess right that's what we're trying yeah. so this may sound like a uh, self-serving question but being at a university i have to ask this can, can you connect the dots in terms of what you did at SIUE and your area of study and then the way that your life uh, went? Well, how did SIUE prepare you? How did your, your college studies prepare you for what, for what you ended up doing? Well, for me, I was got, I had just been elected treasurer of this county as a uh, Bachelor of Science in General Engineering. Uh, West Point, really no accounting, no business, no nothing. I think I always thank the people in Madison County, and they were mostly Democrats at that time, who gave me a chance. That's all. I mean, they they gave me a chance to run this office versus the incumbent. And so I thought, well, I better figure out how, <laughs> how to run this like a business. So you guys had a business program, and I, I uh, signed up. And I'll tell you, I didn't, it wasn't easy. You're like, oh, I'm a West Pointer. This will be, this will be cake. Well, you could grab my, uh, with my grade to find out that it wasn't cake. <laughs> but, and sometimes I was running for election, so then I didn't do well in a class, and I had to retake the class, maybe two classes. Um, which, but I made it within the window. I had six years to get my MBA, so I didn't have to ask for an extension. I may have to plead for, let me take the class over again. Um, but I, I didn't have to, you know, ask for an extended time. And so I was able to speak the language of business by taking the MBA, which was helpful as a treasurer. And I learned about microcodes and automation when there was, we were just starting all that automation world. Um, and then, uh, of course, I'm a conservative Republican and support business. And, 
uh, I, I, what I've learned about business people raising capital, assuming a risk, hoping to get a return. You know, that's the great thing about our freedom is that these business folks, they know that they may not make a return, but they're, they're risking their money and they're risking their time and effort and energy in hopes of getting a return. Uh, it's a great story. And we just got to make sure at the government level that we don't hinder that because that's how new jobs are created, new jobs, um, uh, new people, uh, new technology is, is the innovation that comes from the entrepreneurs of our country. So 24 years in Washington, how often people that you know, people that you don't know, do they approach you in, in the role of mentor or tutor? Uh, how do I, how do I begin a career? Uh, do you think this is the right time for me to run? What, what, what do you suggest about a campaign strategy? Do, do you get those kinds of questions? Yes, but Deb gets them more than I do. Because, uh, <laughs> You know, Deb, my district director, I, I'm political, but I'm not super political. I mean, I, I know I have to do, I mean, if you want to serve, you have to get elected. So to get elected, you have to join a party and, and then you have to campaign. So I, 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 I tell, I am a partisan. That's not a bad word. Um, but there's different levels. And I was fortunate to be surrounded by uh, some more partisan people than me who could help guide me and, and help run my campaign so I could win. Do, do people come to me? Yeah. Um, I've, I've got about four or five right now who are thinking about running for Congress. And they're not just in Illinois. Mm -hmm. um, there's a young man in Oregon. Uh, actually, there's two West Pointers. There's another West Pointer in Florida uh, who uh, has a great, no, he's from Georgia, who has, a, who has an interest. And of course, some of the folks looking at running in Illinois have reached out to uh, ask, but I can tell them how to run a race in Southern Illinois, right? I'm not sure I can tell them how to run a race in the suburbs of Chicago. Um, and and I, as long as they're asking me about that, but I can direct them to people who, I mean, what what's knowledge? Knowledge is not that you know, it's just you know where to get the answer. And so that's what we, uh, I can help kind of get them to people who might be able to help them better than me. I, I would think though that individuals like that probably need to hear a few things from your experience relating to integrity and, and keeping in mind your constituents and some things that are just really foundational to a successful political career. Well, the untold story is what the offices do for everyday citizens. Uh, again, uh, we call it casework. And the stories that we have after 24 years of, of helping citizens and, you know, our, our citizens really would, would like to be able to do that on their own, right? I've got a problem with the Veterans Administration. I'll call them and I'll work this out and we'll, but after a year and a half, they get a little frustrated with the bureaucracy and they call us. And then we, in the terminology is we open up a case, we get their permission, and then we intervene on their behalf. And many times we have success, but I never, when I had the original, I get the original meeting and then I turn over, turn over to staff. It's kind of a great job, right? <laughs> uh, but I, ne I never promised, because you just, you just can't promise that you can, you can deliver, because sometimes they are, they are in the wrong. And they're trying to get recovery for something that they did. And we've got those stories. Uh, World War II veteran issues, uh, Korean vets, uh, obviously the Vietnam era, but IRS, immigration, just some of these stories that did just break your heart. And then, and then you finally get recovery for someone on Medicare disability who hasn't received it in three years and they die. So you, you fight through the whole process with them and they're not even around to, to receive the benefit that they should have gotten three years ago. And that's probably, that's probably a short window. I mean, we've had people who've had longer windows. But we're a country of 330 million people, right? It's, uh, it's, not, it's not easy to do that. 
last week, Veterans Day. That must be a very special day for you. Any memories of anything associated with Veterans Day uh, when you were in Washington? Well, when many of you have been to Washington, uh, Arlington National Cemetery is, is the place to go in the tomb of the unknown. Mm -hmm. um, and go out there when it's like a St. Louis summer, when it's like 95 degrees with 100% humidity, mm -hmm. and see our old guard, guard of the tomb, mm -hmm. or go there when they've got it four inches of snow on their on their on their hat. It's a it's a great tribute to to uh, the sacrifices of those who answered the call to serve. Um, uh, it's great to go uh, when when you, you know, my district got pretty big, you know, 33 counties, um, my last one. And when you have all these small communities take time to honor their veterans. And I think now too, you know, it's probably time to, to do something similar for first responders. We're trying. I mean, there's Law Enforcement Memorial Day. My great great grandfather, I was able to get his name etched on that memorial with my mom when she was still alive. And she she loved it. But we, you know, now we have our healthcare workers, we have our doctors, we have our hospitals. They're man, they are they're in their own war right now. And it's kind of a until we get through COVID, it's still kind of like an unending war. They're like on 24-7, which uh, we should be praying for them. So as we start to wrap up, let, let me ask you a question about your teaching. And when you thought about what do I want to be able to share, how will teaching be in 2021 compared to when you uh, were at a high school a few decades ago? Uh, just talk about that process. What do you want your students to know? How do you go about doing that in a classroom to make that happen? And just uh, from a subject matter, uh, what excites you about teaching? Well, I'm looking over to my students. <laughs> and, you know, I, 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 I would like them to leave uh, both classes with an appreciation for our country uh, that is not perfect. But, you know, it's, it's pretty close to the best thing we got on the planet. Um, the freedom, uh, democracy, the rule of law, our judicial systems. Again, none of them are perfect. Uh, the ability to rise up, uh, these stories of uh, lower to middle class. I always say, you know, I came from middle class. My parents were correct in that. I came from lower middle class. <laughs> My dad was held in alignment with seven kids. Mom would stay at home. So uh, the, uh, and then to be able, I love to tell the story about our, uh, our immigrants who become citizens and then can get elected member of Congress. What other country can you be an immigrant, get citizenship, and then get elected in the, in the legislative body? Uh, both, right? Can't be a president, but you can be a U.S. Senator, and we have them right now. Tom Lantos was another, uh, I was a big fan of Tom Lantos, who was Hungarian uh, concent concentration camp survivor. And I had to talk with uh, Congressman Lantos, and he's, a, he's like a John Lewis. He, he's like a Sam Johnson, if you follow Congress. These are, these are big names. I mean, uh, so Tom Lantos was, was one of those big names that I remember uh, getting the Baltics into uh, NATO was not easy because of the uh, World War II challenges. <coughs> Remember, there was a, a secret treaty that allowed Germany to take Poland and allowed the Soviet Union to take the Baltics. So when the Germans went into the Baltics, they were liberators. So the partisans kind of liked them at first, and atrocities occurred. But then the Soviet Union came back and threw them out. So how do you get the, the, the Jewish community to help the Baltics reconcile their past, but then look west? Uh, the only way I can do it is get Tom Montos involved, who visited, who talked. I mean, you're not going to question the character of Tom Montos. And so uh, for the Baltic integration into the EU and in NATO, he gets a lot of credit. So um, I'm... Uh, I'm blessed to serve with guys like that. So the last year or two, as you 
you realize that 24 years, maybe 24 is about the right amount of time. How did you conceive of that? And then did you know what you wanted to do after that? And now a year or so later, what, what's on the horizon for you? Well, um, 24 years is a long time. And uh, I was, I was tired. Um, many of you know, we had time family, not needed family issues, but uh, had a lot of deaths less, less uh, family members. Uh, so it was good to be home. Uh, so not through all that, but we're pretty close to having everything buttoned up. Um, I love my mom and dad. Karen lost her mom. My West Point parents died also. So, uh, so it was good. I think, again, God is in control. He allowed me as a great window to come back home. Plus, I had 24 years of deferred maintenance on the house that I had to work on. So that's kept me. I was really afraid of just stopping. And you know, because we had our meeting, mm -hmm. and we they said, "Man, I think I'd like to. I need to do something. I think I want. I taught high school. I think I can. I can do a little bit here. I don't want to do it full time. You know, I don't want to work too hard. <laughs> uh, but teaching's hard. If you haven't done it for a while, prep. You know, students, um, and then the grading aspect. Uh, fortunately, I have Gabrielle way over there. She was my TA, a nursing student." And she helped me survive the first semester. And she's been uh, helping me get a little higher level of uh, technology support the second semester. So um, it's been great. I've learned a lot. They're great kids, young women and young men, young adults. Um, and hopefully they'll, you know, they will love their country and try to improve it. Well, let me tell you my Congressman Shinka story now. Um, so I was in Lambert, uh, gosh, this must have been, well, it was the year that, uh, George H.W. Bush, uh, passed away. And, uh, I was going to Washington, D.C. We were arranging a, uh, reception there. And so, um, I was in the airport and, you know, I look up in Congressman Ship because this is, uh, across the aisle as we're sitting ready to get on the plane. And we had met each other a couple of times, and so we kind of waved at each other, and he got up and said, so you're going to D.C., huh? I said, yeah, we're working on a reception, so I'm going to try to get some things set up. And he said, well, we're good. Uh, and so we got on the plane, and we get to Washington, and I get off the plane, and just as soon as I get off the plane, Congressman Shinka says, hey, I want to introduce you to some folks. And he knew two or three people on the plane that were representatives and senators. And so I'm like, well, this is pretty cool, all right, uh, being introduced to all these individuals. And so then he went on, and we ended up meeting again at the uh, baggage carousel. And so he says, well, where are you going? And I said, well... You know, I have some business to do uh, over by the Capitol, but I, I hope to see uh, President George H.W. Bush uh, in the rotunda. And uh, he said, well, why don't you just come with me? And I thought, this is really cool. <laughs> uh, and and we, we approached the uh, Capitol building, and I'm thinking, wonder where Congress people park. You know, and so he had a spot, and I'm just loving every moment of this, right? And we go inside, and he gives me a tour of the whole building. I mean, he, he took a couple of hours and just walked me around and said, these are the committees that meet in this room. This is my office, et cetera, et cetera. And then he said, so you want to see uh, former President George H.W. Bush? And I said, yeah, that's why I'm here. And I said, can you tell me where I go to get in line to, to do that? Because I knew that there would be a, a major line. And he said, let me see what I can do on that. Right. And so I said, let's go over here. And we got on a magic elevator. I still remember the magic elevator. And it went up and it opened and there was the rotunda. And he said, there you go. And I was like from me to Howard from the casket. And I will never forget that kindness. Uh, and I thought, here is a guy who just really appreciates constituents and works hard for them and shows every kind of kindness. So 
Congressman, I can't thank you enough for that day uh, many years ago. Thank you for all you're doing in terms of teaching here. Uh, you're, you're an amazing individual. Thank you for sharing your experiences with our students. Thank you for the collection and what that's going to mean to all of the folks who uh, do research here. And I'm sure they'll find some interesting documents in there uh, at various points. Uh, probably get an email about that at some point. But uh, anyway, so thank you for being here, taking time to uh, answer the questions tonight. And I want to turn it back to uh, Dean Pankel for some closing remarks. On behalf of the SIE Alumni Association and the Lovejoy Library, I would like to thank the following groups that have helped make tonight possible. The SIUE Office of Alumni Affairs, the deans of the colleges and schools of SIUE, the SIUE Directors of Development, the SIUE Marketing Communications Office, as well as the Morris University Center's Event Services and Catering staff for making this an incredible evening. Additionally, in the near future, tonight's video will be available for viewing on the SIUE Alumni Association website. Thank you once again to Congressman John Chimkus and Chancellor Randy Pembroke for making this a great evening. Good night and safe travels.